school. Um, it reminds me of the students who get classically educated become these uh, remarkably interesting people. Uh, and there's stories in classical schools that you only get in classical schools, like a group of third and fourth grade girls at around a campfire or roasting marshmallows. And one of them said, what would s'more be in Latin? And another girl immediately said, oh, it would be shmora. And then together they chanted, shmora, 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 shmora. And then they went back to talking about, you know, snakes and lizards and whatever was on their minds. So, you know, it's, it's wonderful to be, t take a rich tradition, try to, c try to connect ourselves to this tradition and pass it on again to our children and see what happens. But in the process of reconnecting to this tradition, we find frustrations and difficulties. We find that it's an ongoing process of, of rebuilding a bridge, having not been trained how to build bridges. You ever feel that way? Some of you feel come, that you've come later to this than you would have liked. Late have I loved thee, classical education, O oh beauty, great and divine. Uh, late have I loved thee. So uh, there's a kind of lament that comes along with the exhilaration of discovering something so beautiful and rich. Almost like going up into your attic and, and finding some great piece of art. You know, in, in Pennsylvania a few years ago, someone found in the, you know, some, some, one of the four, one of the, one of our early founders, I forget who it was, it was John or Jay Adams, uh, uh, some letter in the back of some old painting, you know, to find something rich that you didn't know was even yours. So there's this dual response sometimes of, uh, of feeling betrayed and neglected and abandoned along with exhilaration. And so I want to give this tradition to my children, and I'm finding that... Um, I don't know it as well as I, wish, as, as I wish. And so as we're continuing to recover this tradition, we're going to experience some frustration and some, uh, and some ongoing discovery. The word tradition just means something that's been handed down. Uh, from tr uh, trotter, uh, to, to hand over hand. We get the word trade from tradition. So you have traditions. And these traditions have become a part of you, sometimes such that you don't even think about them. We're unconscious uh, of them. Oh, thank you. I get to just, what do I, what do, I do here? All you have to do is go to your next slide there. If you need to go back, it's there. Perfect. Right here like that. Go to slide. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. So, in fact, I will use this uh, now. So as we're recovering this tradition, uh, it's like putting together the pieces of a puzzle. Um, here, here are at least 12 different key components to the classical tradition, all represented in these puzzle pieces. And to put them together is, is, is a challenge when you don't have the box top. Have you ever had to put together a, a puzzle having lost the box top? Well, you can find the corners, and you, know, you start from there, but it's, it's no easy task. But to, have, to actually have the box top helps. So what is the box top of the classical tradition? Well, it involves a number of things. Because the tradition is rich, it's deep, it's wide, um, it makes it hard. It's like learning a new culture. Sometimes uh, I, I go to faculties that are just, just starting. Uh, I go to a lot of new startup classical schools. Faculty have been hired, and they'll be teaching in a classical institution for their first time. And they're asking the question, what, is, what does it mean to teach classically? And some of, some of the new teachers are asking the philosophical questions, what is the, philosoph what is the classical tradition? And others are simply saying, what do I do on Monday morning with my students that will please you? They want the specific practices. And I sometimes say to them to try to help them change their approach to say, imagine that I've come to you and I've said, great, we are going to be a French immersion school. We will be teaching in French. We'll be speaking in the hallways in French. We're going to learn a new language and we're going to teach it to our children. That's kind of what we're doing. We have to learn a new culture and a new language. So be patient. It's going to take some time. What's been lost over a generation can't be recovered in a short course. 
And so a lot of what's happened in the recovery is we piece by piece begin to discover some of these things and then start thinking about them, reading the tradition, talking to one another, having conversation, uh, seeking to implement practices that flow out of the tradition, its principles and philosophy, coming back and asking ourselves, how is it going? Uh, learning from other schools, and in a, in a number of different areas. Um, these different rows um, can be, can, can be, but there are a lot of ways of, of summarizing a, a tradition that's as big as this. So this is just one way. It's not certainly the best or the only way, but the row on top, those first three pieces uh, address what is, what is a person. Before we, any educational philosophy has to ask these big questions. Who is a student? What do we teach that student, the curriculum? In what setting and for what purpose? Wouldn't you agree that, among other things, that an educational philosophy must deal with, these would be a part of them? Who, what is a human being? We call that in theology or philosophy, anthropology. What is our doctrine? What is a human being? And so just un, under, that ish, under that question of who is a student, we, we could say, well, the classical tradition says a student actually has a soul. And this is important to emphasize in this day and age because many people do not believe that human beings have souls. And sometimes we act as if we don't believe it either. And that we have bodies, right? So to preserve... Uh, the truth of who we are as image bearers, we must insist that we are enfleshed souls. We have souls and bodies. Well, that seems fairly straightforward. I think I believe that. But do you? Do we? You know, we're often, we often act like practical atheists. And sometimes we act that way as pedagogues, too. And then the third one, uh, this piece, Scole Leisure, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. Uh, human beings were meant to be in communion with God and with one another in a garden. So this idea of coming back to the garden where we're, where we're one with God and, and experience peace with one another, shalom, a flourishing creation with our peers under the lordship of our God, this is the high ideal of being a human being, is it not? And of course, many things flow from this, even from that Genesis narrative. We see the beginning of education when Adam is called to name the animals, to observe and understand things according to their nature and give, give appropriate names based on those observations. It's the beginning of education, the beginning of learning in this garden, the cosmos of which God is the Lord. So we start to pull together. You know, these are big things, aren't they? And then we move to the next row. Well, well, then what do we teach these human beings? How do we form and cultivate in flesh souls? At one point, C.S. Lewis is, is reacting to the materialism of his age, and he says, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. Well, it's both. We have a soul and we have a body and how those two things relate to one another we, we, we puzzle that out and contemplate that throughout the centuries but we are in flesh souls and to deny one or the other is to fall into error what setting what curriculum to what purpose now you can see how Think of me speaking to a group of folks who are new to classical education. How do you, how, where do you begin with something this large? Well, it's appropriate sometimes to do, just cover the box top, and it tends to overwhelm people. But it's also appropriate to take one puzzle piece as a kind of a portal into the cathedral. Because to change the analogy, classical, the classical tradition is like a large cathedral. It's very beautiful. It's impossible to fully take it in, by, in, in a 30-minute tour. In fact, every chapel is worth a week's worth of study. And if you go to some of these beautiful cathedrals where you can en encounter, say, Giotto at uh, uh, San Francesco, I mean, it's just amazing. You, you could spend, Grant, how long could you spend at San Francesco? You could spend your life there. It's just so rich, multiple levels and so on. So you come into this big cathedral and it overwhelms you, but you have to start somewhere. So today, we're going to be focusing on that middle piece on the top, it says embodied. 
that pays attention to the body. The, there's a, there is a thread in the classical tradition that has always paid careful attention to the body. Since the Enlightenment, our focus has been not on the body, but on the mind. And so as the education we've received, which of course has deeply imprinted us and made us who we are in many ways, in ways that we sometimes are seeking to reject and cast off and have trouble doing, tells us that what we're doing is this primarily a rational enterprise. And that is, the rational component to our faith is extremely important and it's good. It's very good. But, you know, we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Enlightenment rationalists and we haven't stopped arguing in terms of ideas. And what this means pedagogically is that we tend to think that the main teaching mode is going to be in front of a whiteboard imparting a Christian worldview and the right list of ideas in which students should believe. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it is not enough if we're not paying attention to the body. Because without trying to address the paradox, the body and the soul are always in a dance with one another. To cultivate a soul, you must do it through the body. And Jamie Smith, in his book, Desiring the Kingdom, has done a very fine job of recovering this tradition. The, the fact that education is embodied and he says it is liturgical by analogy. He doesn't mean it's, it's Christian worship per se, but it is liturgical. And by liturgi lit liturgy, he means formative practices that form human beings. And he says when you really study how we change and grow, we kind of change from the, the body up rather than the neck down. And that what we do with our bodies is critically important to everything that happens to us. So, all five senses come into play here. What, what is happening through the five senses? Smith also says that every pedagogy assumes an anthropology. Every pedagogy assumes and expresses an anthropology. Show me how you teach, and I'll show you what you believe a human being is. He also says that human beings are primarily lovers. We're designed, we're designed and made such to love the things that are lovely. He's ripping off of Augustine there. That we are to order our loves so that our loves are properly aligned with the creation as we, as we encounter it and are immersed in it. And we love. We are designed to love God. We are designed to love, love each other. And that love needs to be cultivated. Our affections need to be cultivated to truly love the things that are lovely and to have our passions and loves, therefore, ordered. And this happens in great part through what happens through your five senses, the body. And yet, what we do with our bodies and the way we encounter the embodiedness of our students doesn't make it into our lesson plans, does it? We focus very much on our scope and our sequence, various other kinds of pedagogical techniques and assessments, but we don't often think about what are we doing with our bodies and um, it's rare that in an academic team setting these things come up. Um, however, if you're about ready to go out to a restaurant tonight and you have, remember the thought experiment, you have some hot cash in your pocket that you have been, been told by Liz Caddow that you must spend tonight and it has to be on an experience, uh, what restaurant will you choose? When you think about going on vacation, now the body starts mattering, doesn't it? The setting matters to you. When you're, when you're inviting friends over for dinner that you cherish, you think about beauty and the music and the decor. And you might even, you might even light an aromatic candle. You might even put on cologne or perfume. You even pay attention to smells. 
And of course, these things, immediately when you walk into an atmosphere like that, you, you with, without, without words being spoken, are absorbing truth. And a, you, it's speaking loudly, isn't it? When you walk into San Francesco and begin to look at those frescoes of Giotto, no words need to be spoken, but something is happening that can be very, very powerful. You walk into a cathedral, and where does your head go? By design, it goes up. The space, the architecture, and what you see, and the, the, even the direction, the way you would move, say, think of the Stations of the Cross, a sequence. There's a scope and sequence built right into the architecture of a beautiful cathedral. Well, is there any kind of scope and sequence to the aesthetic embodiedness of your teaching? Well, we've inherited a pedagogy that's embodied. And now let me just ask a few questions. Looking at the architecture and the, and the, and the rhythms and the practices that have come down to us in American modern education, what assumptions are at play regarding what education is? You tell me. Think about the modern architecture, movement, rhythms, and practices of a, of a modern school. If it's true that every pedagogy, and I, I think and, and, and body practices, assume an anthropology, what do you think modern education assumes a human being is? to prisons. Okay, boy, you go for the harsh analogy first. <laughs> Prison. What else? Andrew? Something that I've noticed about the architecture. Something I've noticed about the architecture of a lot of our uh, public schools is that there aren't windows. Um, and I, th I don't, I mean, I think that's partly safety, right? But then that, that bespeaks an assumption about human nature, mm -hmm. too, that the most important thing is for the kids to be safe, even if it means not letting them see sunlight during the day. Okay, excellent. Safety. Yes, in the back. So, piggybacking on that, um, I worked in a school with very few windows that was built, I think, in the 50s and was told that this was because studies showed that this was more conducive to blah, 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 blah. And uh, that, I think, directly uh, grows out of a certain anthropology, data-driven, the big buzzword right. in public schools today, mm -hmm. which presupposes a kind of uh, mechanistic view of the individual. There's a skill that we want him to be able to do like a robot. If we can find the studies that help us program and hit the right buttons, this study says less windows, okay, less windows. Uh, what, what do we need to do? How do we need to construct? And, 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 and there is, I think, thought, not just, a, mm -hmm. you know, not just unconsiously coming in the architecture. There's an intentionality in the architecture mm -hmm. that, that reflects this idea. If we can push the right buttons by building the right room, putting in the right technology, uh, then the robot will do what it needs to do to get a job. Okay. Notice that Jim is using an analogy of man as machine. Do, do you think there's something to that? If there's no soul, what are we? Uh, in fact, even our, the ways we now describe the cosmos are, we used to, it used to be a you know, hundred years ago or more, they were organic metaphors that the universe was seen as kind of a living organism. But now, it's a machine. And we are a machine within a machine. Because we are materialists. But once you recover the doctrine that we actually have souls that are to be cultivated, that are meant to bear the image of God and are meant to be in union with God, we might start thinking differently about this. So what, uh, what else does the architecture, before we get to rhythms and practices, what else does the architecture of modern school buildings suggest? It's just kind of going with a little bit of what we said, but it, it's like a business. It's efficient. Okay. Everything is built to be as efficient as possible. And what do you mean by efficient? They go for what is uh, most practical. So whether that's uh, literal distances between places, uh, to how students move, to uh, lockers, to aesthetics, 
whatever it has to serve a specific purpose that um, will directly benefit them. In the form versus function dialectic, make some comments about form and function. Yeah, I think, I mean, ultimately it's, it is, I keep coming back to that business model where one time I, I went to, notice I say one time, I went to a, an athletic director's conference that was for public schools primarily. And one whole session literally was about how um, not only in how everything is built, but also in teams that they have was about money. Um, that they, their argument was athletic directors should push to their schools um, sports programs because it means in order of CIF regulations in California, you have to be at school half the day in order mm -hmm. to participate in that game or whatever that is that night. So mm -hmm. it's more likely that students will actually be there mm -hmm. if you have the football field or the mm -hmm. blah, 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 or whatever, whatever that might be. And if students were there that day, they got money. So ultimately it was that, is that business model where everything was built around um, the practicality of the business, of them getting money. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's a balance between that where a school has to function and run as a business, but mm -hmm. uh, it has trickled into the classroom uh, and into the teacher's mindset and how everything runs. And there's this cult really of efficiency that, that if something is not efficient, it is not good. Mm -hmm. So with form and function, I mean, that's so eloquently stated, I don't need to say it anymore. So thank you, but what about form and function? Which is more important in a modern school? I think it's, I mean, it's, it's like many things that we see. You know, we see Christ coming full of grace and truth. Mm -hmm. And so we really do need form and function. Mm -hmm. I think that we need a balance of the two. Mm -hmm. I think that um, we, there is benefit to both, but mm -hmm. we see a lot of things that God has created for us to have that in that harmony, to have mm -hmm. in that balance. And any time that we lose one and, and favor the other, mm -hmm. uh, we lose out on the benefit of, of one or the other. Mm -hmm. And obviously, in modern education, we have moved to more of a function mm -hmm. atmosphere versus necessarily just the form, when really there is benefit to both. Okay, that's so well said. Everyone heard that. Um, function. And just to move on a little bit, because I want to get to now the practices and rhythms of schools, but just to talk about the architecture, it assumes certain practices and suggests certain practices and is made for certain practices. And efficiency is certainly a high ideal. And you mentioned f f being functional. We are functionaries. We are, we are raising up functionaries. We are, we, are, we are raising up workers in a system who who need to find their slots in society because the entire system is sometimes be, is presupposed as something that needs to be really efficient. And what's lost in the process is beauty. Beauty is not really on the table anymore. And yet beauty is what draws our soul out and makes us contemplate the things that are also good and actually humanize us and draw us to God himself. Beauty is... is it's almost like we're teaching half of a student now because we're materialist. We, we don't, the aesthetic is, is, is almost just something we consider in passing. Aaron? So just uh, an illustration from, from my life. I went to, when I first started high school, I was at a school that was built in the early 1900s, but it was beautiful, and, and I don't know architecture well, but it was, you looked at it and you were, you were in awe of the buildings and there was columns and there was all kinds of things. About halfway through my high school years, uh, I transferred to a newer school and a modern school um, and, and everything is squares and boxes and there's no windows, whereas the first school there are big windows and there are, like I said, columns and spires and, and all kinds of those things. But I thought that was very, uh, it epitomizes this idea where where earlier on there was still this idea that beauty uh, was a part of education, it was a part of what we were doing, mm -hmm. um, and, and then this, this new school that I went to that was built you know, in the 80s or 90s, uh, everything, everything is a box, you don't need beauty. I mean, what, beauty doesn't help the student to be a better worker mm -hmm. or uh, accomplish those things, and I thought that that is the picture that I see. Okay. 
Smith talks about how we need a, pedagog a pedagogy of desire that cultivates lovers. It's hard to do that in a cement box. So the question that I want you to keep in the back of your mind as we progress for further is, since you've spent 20 years being educated this way, has it imprinted you? Has it habituated you? Has it blinded you so that you can't even see these things any longer? Is it such that you can walk into a, a square box and not think it's unusual? To think that it's appropriate and okay, fine, what it should be? Now there's a place for, we, you know, we do have to be stewards. We have to take care of the financial. There are times when even in our own homes and the restaurants we choose to go to, we, we can't always uh, uh, experience the ideal, but we can know that it's the ideal. We can know what we want and need, and we can work towards it, right? And you can beautify almost anything. You can be, we may have to be in some square rooms without windows. And we're not without means even then. But sometimes we just give up and we don't know how to make things beautiful. Not just visually, but in every aesthetic dimension, we sometimes lack imagination. So what about you? Have you become no longer aware of this, desensitized to this? because it's been 20 years and we pass it on without even knowing we're passing it on. We pass on a desensitized apparatus and receptor for beauty and we also make the mistake, this is what this is the, the essential thesis of of Smith's book, is that we think that if we can stand in front of a whiteboard and teach in, in an engaged fashion, teaching the Christian ideas and teaching with energy and enthusiasm and a good curriculum and good assessments that that will be enough. But it's not. It's not sufficient. Because the formative practices that our students are encountering outside of our schools are immensely powerful. And they're aesthetically oriented. Uh, Smith uses the mall as an example of this. He says the mall has been designed by aesthetic geniuses. So that when you go to the mall, you, it's a worship experience. He, he uses a thought experiment of a Martian visiting, visiting a mall. If you go to the mall, there's a liturgy there that, will, that assumes a certain ideal of human flourishing. And it gets its message through. But it's through the five senses primarily. It's not through the rational. It's not through the spoken word. You come into the cathedral and you see a, a worship guide as soon as you get there, directing you to all the various chapels that you can, that you can, that you can visit. And there is icon, uh, iconography all over, displaying uh, visions of the good life and the vestments of which you should wear and change regularly in order to experience the good life. And you can walk into one chapel or another and be greeted very congenially by a priest or priestess who will engage you in a Eucharistic exchange of thanksgiving and admiration where you can acquire the vestments and other things that will, will bring you into the society. And you always go with friends. You ever go to the mall alone? And you experience beautiful scents, beautiful music, water moving, colorful images that change on a monthly basis and if you go to hot topics I think on a daily basis there are new things for you. Don't you love dropping your 13 year old daughter off at the mall? Because you know that the mall is doing its work and creating a love and a passion in your daughter that gets to the root of her and stays and grows. and She becomes a lover consumption and it works these marketing genius it works we go back and back we think about these things we dwell in we think we need to have these things but we don't do it in our own schools we don't do it in our own churches some of us don't do it in our own homes we've become the utilitarian home dwellers and school dwellers we're happy with bare walls 
Or if you're in second grade, just give me a lot of plastic visual aids in primary colors. I want a number line, I want the alphabet, I want the math meeting center. I put up all that plastic everywhere so when it's time for me to teach, I can just point here. It's a lovely sight when you come into a second grade room. There's plastic stuff everywhere. Right? We become utilitarian. We become efficient. And we're also doing, now I'm, now I'm not talking about you so much, but we're doing test prep. We're moving kids through hoops. And we're engaging in that cram, test, and forget cycle to show via data-driven assessments that we're actually doing something that deserves the praise and the salary from our administrators who are also seeking federal money, who seek the same praise and affirmation and validation. And kids are forgetting things. And we use the same pedagogies, now switching to you, we tend to use the same pedagogies because they've been handed down to us and they feel right. It's just what we know. It's what we know. And to some degree, it's what we are we have assumed an ideal of human flourishing that is in contradiction with what we confess. What we do with our bodies and what we do with our rhythms and practices in many ways contradict what we actually believe and confess. So what we need to do is ferret out and ask to what degree am I still living habitually in Egypt? What do I want to plunder? What gold do I take? But what needs to be left behind? So this is a challenge for you as, we, as you go on. In your, in your academic teams, could you make this a question? In what ways do our practices assume an anthropology that we reject? And be honest about it. In what ways do our pedagogies assume an anthropology that we actually reject? Could we start making connections to our pedagogies and these assumptions of, 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 of human flourishing? Just to have that being, be, you know, you're all smart, classical educators, this would be a great, this would just be a good dialectic discussion, you know, just to, just to do this and explore it. And be slow, don't be reactionary, don't go to Liz and say, you know what? We're, we're getting rid of those number lines. They're plastic. Everything plastic. Down. Down plastic. Burn them in the backyard. Uh, no. Or, you know, I see we have these trailers, you know, these, uh, these temporary buildings. Burn them. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we have, there is a place for growing into things. Right? So don't be reactionary and extreme, but begin to wrestle with these questions. Look, our students are making their decisions about what they love. It's maybe sometimes hard, hard to accept, not because of the 75% of the time you spend in front of the whiteboard. They leave the class, they put in the earbuds, they get on the internet, they're going to Facebook, they're watching movies, they're watching TVs on Netflix, they're going to the mall, they're in, in love with sports, they're in love with Hollywood, and this is what's grabbing them and saying, this is who I am. This is what I want to be. It's not your class in apologetics that's rationally based. That class is needed. It's very important. Smith says, he's a philosopher, it's not enough. It's just not enough. Now, we're going to move into a discussion phase now, Andrew and I, and we're going to start engaging you. But let me give you a couple of resources for further study. Um, Jamie Smith's book, Desiring the Kingdom, which is about these cultural liturgies, is worth, worth reading. Um, he, on classicaleducator.com, we've interviewed him, and there's about uh, 15 clips of him speaking for about three or four minutes at a time on questions like this. So you can just hear him speak about it. Um, another, another resource on classicaleducator.com is a, a, a presentation that was video recorded by Jenny Rollins called the... Uh, the liturgical classroom, something like that. It's worth viewing. There's schools around the country that are watching that video <coughs> and then having discussion about it, <coughs> asking how what she describes might be possible in, 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 in their classes and in other schools. Jenny has been thinking about this for about three years and then seeking to make application in her classrooms. And so we're going to have 
some discussion, and then that's where we're going to end. We're going to end with, all right, if, if we have these ideals of human flourishing that are different, then what practices might, might, we worth, might be worth exploring? So we'll be dividing up into groups, and you'll be having some discussion about what practices might we ask if we should continue, and what practices might we want to start? And just be patient with yourselves, and again, you know, some of you will naturally be reactionary, and some of you will say, I think we need to be really slow, but let's start the conversation, right? And by the way, you're not starting at zero here. Some of you naturally understand these things, and if you haven't used some of the vocabulary that Smith suggests or that I'm using, you've been thinking about this already. It already is resonating with you. You've already been making progress. Just to walk into this building shows me that. There's already, you have already tried to visually embody something about your ideals. The way that you conduct this conference, the, the dinner party last night that I enjoyed with several of you, was the pinnacle. I mean, what, what happened last night, having great food and drink in a beautiful setting, and so, Southern California is always beautiful, the weather's always beautiful, that's what I hate about it. Uh, it was that, the discussion that we had around table uh, this, yes, the cigars came out too, which I think is a very fine thing. Uh, this was paideia. It's 360 degree education, and it was embodied. People that you love in a setting that you love, with great food and drink that you love, talking about the ideas that you love, this, this forms us. And, and let me just close with this as we go to this next section. This idea of embodied education assumes that education is formation. Education as formation, then therefore it must involve the body as well as the intellect. It's formation. Contrary to education as imparting of information. It's formative. And so we need formative practices that counter form against the cultural liturgies, the secular liturgies that are forming our, our students. We need to be subversive. We need practices that begin to get at the gut of our students, that appeal to their affections and make them want to shout and admire and praise and love something because they want to be a lover of the true, the good, and the beautiful. And we hand forth Cheetos and Coke. Where's the beauty? Where's the surprise? Where's the good stuff? Grant last night brought out the good stuff. 25-year-old scotch. Right? Why do we give our kids Kool-Aid and crackers? Pedagogically, aesthetically. Okay, uh, Andrew, come on up and let's talk. Would, would someone be willing to, to fill up a cup of coffee for me? I would really appreciate that. Okay, time check. We're at, uh, we have like a half hour, right? Sounds good. Okay, why don't everybody just take a two or three minute break to stretch a little bit, get, get something to drink, and then we'll come back for this discussion. Yes, coffee, thank you. We'll take just three or four minutes.
together. <clears throat> test, test, test. All right, everyone, let's make our way back. Please get that cup of coffee or orange juice and come, come forward. Okay, we've talked about architecture and we've, we've touched a little bit about on uh, rhythms, thank you. Um, but rhythms, rituals, routines, and practices um, are shaping the loves of our students. Um, perhaps more so than our, the, the lecture mode of our, uh, of our, of our teaching. So, could we start planning what we're going to do with, with rhythms and routines, what we do with our bodies? Um, let's go to a discussion now, and, and uh, I'm just going to ask Andrew to respond. And, uh, and you know, Andrew is also uh, uh, a pastor as well as an educator, so he thinks about this from the church perspective. One of the comments he made to me is that you know, the school is not the church. It doesn't do word and sacraments. It doesn't practice discipline. And yet, there's a sense in which liturgical elements come into the church, or to the school. So, Andrew, talk about that and tell us, you know, give us your response to this. Okay. Uh, yeah, one thought is that the word liturgy may even be foreign to many of us. Uh, so, what is liturgy and, um, and why, why is it important? So, liturgy, the word liturgy, just so you know, comes from, from the Greek uh, laos, which means people, and then latos, it becomes latos, and ergon. Ergo, you, you hear in that energy, ergos, ergo. So the work, energy, the energy that ex, is expended, that's mm -hmm. basically what work is, of the people. The people being uh, not individuals necessarily, but the people together doing work. It could also be then translated public service or public worship. Uh, worship is work. Uh, it's good work. And so uh, when we talk about liturgy, hello, hello. When we talk about liturgy, that's um, a purposeful embodied practice. There you by go. The way. Exactly. Uh, when you talk about liturgy, we're talking about the work of the people. So it becomes apparent immediately that we already have a liturgy, right? You already have a way in which you work with the people, uh, whether it's your church or whether it's a school or whatever organization, there is a liturgy. There is something that we do together in the public as work. And so I think one good question to start with is to look at our, our classroom, a place where it's public, where we work, mm -hmm. and to say, do I have a good liturgy or do I have a bad liturgy? Mm -hmm. Or do I have a liturgy that could be better? Um, a lot of times people say well, this is a liturgical church because they say these things, they sing in this way, they're old. Uh, and we have non-liturgical churches, as if you don't have a liturgy in that church. But really, what you have is one that's been planned out for a while and one that's more spontaneous. And the question then we might ask is, with regard to the classroom, since that's what we're concerned with, uh, is it better to do something spontaneous because it's more authentic? Or is it better to think through something? Do our administrators care that we have a lesson plan or if we just let the Spirit lead, right? Um, and it becomes apparent that maybe what we do will be more excellent, more godlike, if we've thought it through, if we've planned it out, if the public work is something that, um, that we take seriously. So that's, that's one thought, very kind of general. Um, but, you know, I mean, I could tell you that uh, at some churches you come in and the pastor says, the Lord be with you, and all the people say, and also with you, and I say, your, our help is in the name of the Lord, and the people say back, who made heaven and earth, and we go through this thing, and you're like, okay, that's, that's, that's boring, rote, and everything, and, and, but that's a liturgy. But I could also tell you of another church where you come in, and you sing two songs, and, uh, and then some, guy, some person comes up and greets you and says some opening things and welcomes people. There are three more songs. That, the, the band goes down. The, uh, the pastor comes up, does his thing, he finishes, another song ends. That's a liturgy. And, that, and that's a good liturgy. It's been thought through, regardless of whether it seems that it was, regardless of whether you realized it or not. 
probably have beat that, that horse, that dead horse. Um, but at, at least I think we should realize that liturgy surrounds public activity. I like the way you made the contrast between a, a spontaneous liturgy and then one that maybe has been more thoughtfully th planned. And I wonder if that's a, a question for you guys to consider as well. Is your classroom liturgy um, something that you, that you plan, or is it always spontaneous? And Yes. Oh, maybe. I think you're on. I think you oh, okay. Testing one, two. Testing one, two. I can just, I'll grab the hat. There's another one over here. Two test. Uh, the 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 comparison between say spontaneous and more planned liturgy. I think that could be a question for classrooms as well. I know as an educator, often I didn't, I don't, I don't, I did not give much thought to my Latin classes. I just after a while, I just came and did the same thing. Um, it was kind of like, hey, everybody, good to see you. That might be my greeting. Let's turn to uh, chapter 13. Hey, Jenny, you need to come in, please. Where is, is, is Ron here? Where's Ron? Uh, Jenny, would you go get Ron before you come in? Thank you. All right, the rest of you, please turn to, to, turn to chapter 13. All right, what we're going to do today, that's, that was be my greeting. And my, my, uh, my dismissal was kind of great. All right, before you go, for chapter 14 tomorrow, make sure. Uh, I didn't put this on the board yet, but just listen. Hey, hey guys, guys, hey, hey. Hey, okay, tomorrow, first 10 sentences, exercise one. Got it? All right, thanks. All right, have a great day. Uh, and of course, usually I'm surprised by the bell myself. Oh, gosh, got to stop. I've never done that before. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, part of this, I think, this is an exciting kind of conversation for us to think through and to, and to think how we might do this. Um, but how do we, we, especially in the upper school, well, I think in both in both, in, in all three areas of our school, uh, it, we have an opportunity. In, in upper school, we have block schedule, and that provides time. That provides the opportunity, I think intentionally, to, um, to take time to do those things, um, to say to our student, to greet our students. How do we greet our students? Is that important? Ought we to start... Um, Ought we to read the Psalms every day? There's 150 Psalms. There's 180 days in the school year. Um, ought we to take time to acknowledge every day what it is we're doing here and remind our students and ourselves why we're doing this? Uh, is there time to recite together what we believe, to remind ourselves that as we go forward in these things, and study these amazing truths of God that, that we're part of a, a faith. And, and the other thing I think a caveat too is sometimes in Christ, classical Christian schools, we go, we like to do old stuff because it's kind of nostalgic. And nostalgic stuff feels good or it looks good or it, you know, we don't even, we don't, we don't say that, but it's like, I just want to do something nostalgic. Uh, and I think that's the absolute wrong reason and the wrong thing to go for. We are saying, what better I would say is, Somehow, the thing that we've inherited, that, that we've lost when the schools became boxes and that we're trying to recover, has some old stuff. It's not good because it's old. It's good because it was excellent, and we think of new ways to do that. We're not trying to be a stodgy people with, you know, it's not, or, 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 you know, Harry Potter's cool now, so uh, it's actually cool to be kind of wear, wear robes and to, and to have houses and to, and to you know, to like Gryffindor and stuff, you know? That's not why we do what we do, even if it looks like that. So um, that's just a caveat. I'm not suggesting uh, or even kind of just, uh, yeah, advocating to do something old because it's been done before and because it makes you feel good. But I do think there's value in realizing that um, the history that we have inherited, and when we go back and we start mining that, we start exploring it, we start... Um, uh, considering it, we go, well, that worked pragmatically, that, you know, utilitarian, that worked because it was good and because it was engaging the, the, the mind the, and, the, and, the, and the body. Um, and so in our classrooms, greeting, um, you know, declaring what we believe, 
reminding ourselves what this is that we do, uh, maybe even singing, maybe even singing a benediction at the end, thanking God for these things, realizing that every, you know, in, in, uh, inculcating thanksgiving in our students and replacing cynicism with thanksgiving. Um, I love the way uh, Andrew talked about that, and you see here we have some traditional liturgical elements on the screen that by analogy could be uh, generate ideas for our classes. Uh, Jamie Smith says that we should mine the ecclesial tradition, that this is where we can find the kind of rhythms and practices that, that can enrich our schools. By the way, there's another book called Teaching and Christian Practices, edited by Jamie Smith and David Smith from, uh, from Calvin College, in which there's some further uh, essays about this from professors around the country, mainly thinking of the college uh, application, but it works for K through 12 in many ways too. David Smith has an essay on hospitality, Christian hospitality and teaching practices. And he just begins to think through, if we believe in hospitality, how do we show hospitality to our students? Well, it's here. There's hospit I feel like there's been hospitality coming to this conference. The way that Chris, Lay, uh, Chris Lee int uh, interacted with me via email was very welcoming. Certainly Liz, the same. When, uh, the, the coffee that's here, the being greeted when I came in, the name tags, people, all, all of that shows hospitality. And, and, and it just changes everything, doesn't it? But why don't we think through that more through the entire school day, the rhythm of our days and our weeks and our months? We have a church calendar that we follow. Is there a kind of academic calendar that could be embodied? So I think there's three applications here. One is a personal one, the liturgical you. Uh, what about your own patterns of worship and living that live out your faith and your beliefs and your ideals of what it means to be a human being who bears the image of God and has been redeemed by him? Uh, you know, Starbucks in the morning, checking email, the first thing. I have got my iPhone on my bedside. First thing I do when I wake up in the morning is... Declare the glory. Of, no, uh, it's check my email, right? And that's what I do when I go to bed. I frame my day by checking email. That's a liturgy. It's a personal liturgy. And it assumes a certain ideal of what it means to be flourishing. Don't you try to, aren't you fighting against that? So I think there's a personal battle where we have to embody things ourselves first. Uh, singing. Are you singing? Do you sing even alone? Uh, music. Um, so there's a personal element, then there's your classroom element, and then there's the whole school perspective. What kind of liturgies does a school at large have? How are students greeted when they come to school on Monday morning? How are they dismissed in your classroom, but how are they dismissed when school is out? Is it chaos? Bell ring? How do you, all these things can be thought through. Yeah, I was thinking uh, as you were talking about that, how I think we have a good liturgy. Right, and I think that's, uh, I mean, I think about what, I don't know, maybe every school has the head of school out greeting the parents in the morning. I doubt it. Um, and I'm not trying to, you know, just, hey, we're amazing. But I think that we are thoughtful about these things. And that's part of what makes this special. It's part of what makes us appreciate it. And we should, I mean, I think we should appreciate that. And it, there is more we can do. There's more we can do uh, in our personal lives. It's funny you were talking about that. I have uh, what looks like a Bible that is by my side all the time, and it's actually an iPhone. <laughs> so people think I'm being holy and I'm texting. <laughs> or sometimes I say, well, I'm reading my Bible on my phone that's in my Bible-looking thing. It's like Inception or something. Um, uh, but I think that, um, I think that yeah, being, being mindful and careful and thoughtful, how might we speak in our respective, in, in, in grammar school, about starting the day? Um, and we have that liturgy that's a school liturgy, which is, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance, taking prayer requests, and the, the school verse, and all those things. Um, so how might we add to that? How might we, as you said, take the boxes that we have and make them beautiful? Make them beautiful so that kids reflect upon on art and, and on God's glory. Um, and how might, we, um, how might we continue to grow? And one thing I would recommend... Uh, is to study it. So the rest of the summer, just, um, just Google it. Just go and, what is liturgy? What is the history? What is, um, what is morning and evening prayer? What, um, I have here the, the Book of Common Prayer. 
Um, and it's not that you need to use this, but what a great resource. You look in the front, it tells you scriptures that will form your life su every Sunday and Monday through Friday. There are prayers you can do that, uh, for, with your class. Um, it's a great resource. Uh, the, the academic year, in, in large measure, um, echoes the liturgical year, the church year. Um, the church year, uh, as opposed to being like the solar year that the, 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 the world uses, we use January 1st, Happy New Year. Happy New Year happens in November at the beginning uh, in, in the church. And in school, that means Advent. There's colors associated. There's, there, are, there, are, there are feasts associated with it. There's anticipation. There's, uh, there's ways in which history, um, looking at the lives of saints and celebrating those things on special days. All of these things are things I think that we might want to just explore. Just maybe that's a, a tool we could use. That's excellent. Um, so what, what I think we should do now is I'm going to just give you, uh, this, is be, this will be dissatisfying, but a list of practices that I've observed in schools that are trying to do this. And that can, be, can maybe help generate some of your ideas. And then when I finish that list, let's break up into some groups and have you do some uh, generation yourself and, and ask, ask questions about practices that might be worth considering, some that you might want to stop, some that you might want to start. And let's just regard this as the beginning of a conversation. And then we'll give you some opportunities to report back and also express some concerns and ask some questions as we close. But there are schools thinking about this all over the country and trying to become more intentional. I just visited the Ambrose School in Boise, Idaho about uh, a month or so ago, and they had the opportunity to actually build a school about four years ago and think carefully about how they wanted to embody, visualize their ideals. So when you come into the Ambrose School, your body is impacted when you walk through the doors. And it's by design, just like coming into a cathedral. The first thing you encounter is their library. You see the second floor of the library kind of like a loft. And you can even see some of the wood paneling kind of up there. So the wood is very attractive. They have wood everywhere, lots of dark wood kind of accenting the entire building. And then you look further and you see the glass doors to the first level of the library. And you can see the shelves behind the glasses and the dark oak tables all around. And then you look to your left and there is a large coffee shop that's better than the local Starbucks by far. Four or five leather couches, leather chairs, uh, stone walls, um, dark wood, uh, big black and white photographs of graduating classes, a granite um, bar, and a barista behind it making $2.50 real lattes, uh, manned by parents, and it's self-sustaining. Pastors come to drop their kids off at Ambrose, and they never leave the school. They are preparing their sermons on one of those leather couches, and they check in with their son uh, at lunch and so on. Teachers can come into that coffee shop, meet with uh, parents, have you know, small meetings. Juniors and seniors are allowed to go there at, uh, when they have free time. Um, see what they've privileged? The school says, we love books, and we love community. You walk through the... And no, without a word being spoken, the first thing you smell is good coffee brewing. Um, so that's, that's, would you like that? <laughs> uh, and, and now they're going to go out, they have a patio where they're going to start extending it outside. So, and then throughout the hallways, you will see beautiful pictures. There's the high school level, <clears throat> you're walking down a hallway that's about as, about as far as me to the end of the, to the exit sign there maybe even a little farther. And at the end of the hallway is a stairwell, but on the top of the stairwell is a, something like a eight by eight, really large replica painting of Da Vinci's Last Supper. So instead of just seeing all the lockers and things, I see Da Vinci as I'm walking, and my eye is attracted to it, and I want to get closer to it to observe it. And then on the walls, there is beautiful art that depicts the historical period that the various classes are studying. So you've probably seen this in some schools. You probably do something here. If you go into fourth grade there, you encounter a knight in shining armor that's six feet tall, a really nice one. And when you walk into the room, it, you, you, you feel like you're kind of coming into the feudal era. All of the art, all of the artifacts. It's a museum. And this is the idea 
uh, of ancient education, that uh, education and wonder, Plato talked about paideia musicae, was to see the world as a living museum. So school as museum. I was at the Wheaton uh, College Bible Department about uh, a few weeks ago. There, has anyone been there? Oh, Jim, yeah. Jim, just talk about it. What, what, what do you experience when you walk through the corridors of the Bible Department? Well, so probably what, what's going to stand out to you most is a, a kind of a, a well, a kind of a modern art depiction of the the Via Dolorosa, uh, and with and the, the steps of Christ with uh, photographs of uh, of people acting out the steps of Christ to the cross. Uh, then you have a a uh, a crucifix that is uh, very interesting, very well done, but it's actually made out of trash from. From uh, from vacuum dust, right? That's right. Uh, before you get to that, though, you have the glass cases with uh, all of the artifacts. And as an Old Testament scholar, I'm particularly fond of that area from their their digs in Ashkelon. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and and the the layout is. Uh, you know, very. It, it was, I, I guess, a few years ago. I never saw it as as this because I, um, you know, it was before uh, before. Uh, I think I even uh, really visited the Bith department there, uh, much less was was hired there. But the uh, before it was uh, just store rooms, and they converted it to to move them up there. And it's uh, right, so they're they're uh, the the entire construction is is conducive to community. Uh, in the middle, there's kind of some open lounge area. Uh, glassed off from a faculty lounge area, which uh, is usually not strictly enforced. I know there are some faculty that were a little irritated about, uh, about that. Uh, and a high ceiling with a high skylight and sort of a vertical eye line that uh, directs you to that skylight. Um, and uh, then the classrooms there as well are, are kind of glassed in, so creating this sense of community that you can see seminars going on and people discussing as you walk by. You know, sometimes you might want to jump in and in fact uh, in a Hebrew class I taught in one of those rooms I occasionally would have other faculty jump in and, and maybe mock out what I was doing or something uh, so yeah that's uh, my nutshell version of it so we have to think uh, by analogy what could we do we the, you know that takes some great resources uh, resources that I'm sure we don't have but what can we do with what we have there are schools that are be beginning their days intentionally. And Noah could talk to my son about how at our, at our school in Harrisburg, they, we begin the day with kind of a matins and songs that are being sung and, and doxology at lunch, right? And every in the morning or every afternoon, is it, that everybody gets out of the hallways of the school throughout and the music teacher gets on the intercom and, and gives the note and then a cappella, the entire school will sing outside the halls a hymn. And it, when they were doing this a couple of years ago, they were just doing it on Friday afternoons. It was so beautiful that parents would come early to pick up their kids so they could just hear it, stand in the hall. So from kindergarten to 12th grade, everyone in the whole school is standing outside of the rooms and they sing. Um, and music is present at the school. Our, the music director at our school is thinking that music is for everyone as much as possible uh, throughout the day. So <clears throat> all of the faculty members who play a musical instrument Many of them are bringing their musical instruments and they're just in their rooms. So the fourth grade teacher is a master clarinetist and bassoonist. So he just has, it's out, his instruments are out. They're just in the classroom. And that itself is a pedagogy. And those fourth graders want to hear him play. And he'll just sometimes play. The kids are coming in from recess. He's just in his room playing. You can hear it. He'll play in the morning at the, for the morning assemblies. And it's not always just programs. It's just music is there. I, if I can play a musical instrument, why wouldn't I play it? Uh, we had a, a master guitarist who was one of our teachers, and he had the same, his guitar was always out. Our first grade teacher is a, is a trained artist, so he is always drawing on his whiteboard beautiful things, delighting the first graders, even when he's not teaching. If he's, if he's teaching a story, he'll draw it while he's teaching sometimes. He's using that skill. There are many, many different practices that uh, I'm starting to observe, and let me just ask this in the form of questions, and then we'll go to a conversation.